Hello everyone, uh, good morning and good afternoon depending on your location. This is Brooke Akins and on behalf of Q1 Productions and IBA Industrial, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar and thank you for joining us. Today's webinar will focus on e-beam sterilization basics with a focus on conversion from gamma to e-beam and systems descriptions. We're very lucky to have Dr. Byron Lambert who is a Senior Associate Research Fellow in Sterilization Science and founder of Abbott's Assurance of Sterility Task Force at Abbott. Uh, and we also have Byron, uh, or I'm sorry, Byron is joined by uh, Cody Wilson, who's a product manager, uh, business development director at IBA Industrial. And Byron and Cody will be speaking to e-beam sterilization for medical devices, um, as well as the tr transition from gamma to electron beam sterilization, including relevant regulations and resources for material effects. Uh, please note that a copy of the recording will be sent to all registered attendees along with a survey upon completion of today's webinar. And there will be a few minutes at the end of the webinar where the presenters will be taking questions specific to medical devices. And you can submit your questions via the Q&A option in your Ring Central toolbar at any time during the presentation. I do encourage you to be as specific as possible when submitting these questions. Please feel free to include an example or reference back to a particular area within the presentation excuse me, to better assist our presenters in thoroughly answering your questions. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenters and I'll begin with Byron Lambert. Uh, Byron has been with Abbott for 30 years and has provided sterilization leadership within quality operations and R&D. His sterilization responsibilities focus on developing innovative terminal sterilization solutions for sensitive combination products. Uh, he's recently co-edited Assurance of Sterility for Sensitive Combination Products and Materials, New Paradigms to Bring Innovation to Healthcare Products to Patients, um, and he's published numerous journal, article, journal articles and book chapters. We've also got Cody Wilson. Uh, Cody joined IBA in 2020 and is responsible for product development and marketing shaping uh, to enable customer transition to sterilization modalities. Cody has extensive experience in system integration using electron beams and process development making use of sensors for feedback. Uh, Byron and Cody will later be joined by their IBA industrial colleague uh, Jeremy Brisson who's in R&D program in rhododendron, pro I'm sorry, Rototron product, he's the Rototron product director at IBA Industrial, excuse me about that. Uh, right now, I'd like to hand it over to Byron, who will be presenting first. Again, feel free to submit questions uh, throughout the presentation, but right now, I will be handing it over uh, to Byron for our first presentation. Hey. I'm delighted to deliver this webinar on converting to e-beam sterilization. It is based on a talk I gave at the Midwest Medical Device Sterilization Conference nearly a year ago at Fermilabs near Chicago. The conference was part of an initiative by the DOE and NNSA for radiological security through alternative technology. IBA and MEVEX gave an inspiring collaborative presentation at the conference about the potential of the e-beam and x-ray markets to grow and meet needs in the industry. I was excited to hear their presentation for many reasons. I'm on the board of directors for the International Radiation Association. As such, I get a better than average view of the beneficial uses of radiation processing technology. In the healthcare sector, as we'll be discussing today, but also in the food industry for the safety of our food supply, and in many applications and sectors by facilitating advanced materials that improve our lives. For example, Abbott uses e-beam technology to enhance materials for some of our medical devices. Relative to my personal experience converting to e-beam sterilization, I've had a long career at Abbott Labs and predecessors, Guidance and ACS, and founded their Assurance of Sterility Task Force, or ASDF. I had the opportunity in the 1990s to help Abbott Vascular convert from 100% ethylene oxide sterilization to 50% e-beam sterilization. As part of that work, I led the charge to put in a 10 MeV e-beam sterilizer in Temecula that has been bringing value to the business for 23 years. 
Abbott has continued over the decades to install e-beams and use e-beam sterilization significantly in our sterilization network. Today we'll be talking specifically about the physical and regulatory realities that facilitate converting from gamma radiation sterilization to e-beam radiation sterilization. Another practical reality to keep in context, however, is that gamma radiation sterilization will remain a critical and beneficial workhorse of the medical device sterilization industry for decades to come. The webinar will begin by looking at the medical device sterilization market and the market drivers for changing sterilization modalities and what that perspective is over the decades. We'll then discuss the physical realities of the three modalities of ionizing radiation used for medical device sterilization, gamma, E-beam, and X-ray. Despite gamma and X-ray being photons, it turns out that electrons are the main actors in all three modalities. Through that lens, we'll then discuss the guidance in the ISO 11137 radiation sterilization standards for transferring from one radiation sterilization modality to another. Finally, we'll discuss some case studies from my experience at Abbott with e-beam sterilization. Hopefully, we'll have time and technology to field some questions at the end following Cody's presentation. As published by the International Radiation Association, e-beam has some 5% of the medical device sterilization market. Gamma and EO combined have about 90% of the market, with gamma having about 40% and EO about 50% of the market. As mentioned earlier, I helped Abbott Vascular to convert from 100% EO sterilization to 50% E-beam sterilization in the 1990s. The E-beam schematic in the top left corner is the E-beam we installed in Temecula. The key point to highlight from this slide is one of our Abbott ASTF taglines for sterilization, innovation over decades. It took a decade to convert from 100% EO to 50% E-beam. And after seven years, we were only at one half of 1% conversion. The list on the left is a partial list of all the reasons why the process of converting sterilization modalities is so painfully long so much of the time. In the 1990s, the business driver for the initiative to convert from EO to E-beam sterilization was supply chain improvements. The ability to have a two to three day contract sterilization time from a local E-beam vendor versus a 10 to 14 day EO sterilization cycle time brought enormous value to our supply chain management and to our ability to be responsive and deliver products to our customers when they needed it. Bringing an e-beam on site reduced the sterile cycle time even further, close to just in time. When customers needed product, we could manufacture and sterilize product in less than a day. Today, that landscape has changed. The EO industry is facing significant pressure, represented by the asterisk, from the EPA relative to the environmental concerns of EO emissions. There's also ongoing concerns about EO residuals on products, especially for medical devices used on babies and smaller patients. The EO sterilization contract network is under significant pressure. This pressure is another market driver to explore E-beam, and also alternative gas and or vapor sterilization technologies such as hydrogen peroxide, nitrogen dioxide, and vaporized parasitic acid. In parallel with this, the gamma radiation sterilization market is experiencing pressure from security and supply chain concerns. The gamma industry is responsibly addressing these issues, but the focus of initiatives like the Midwest Medical Device Sterilization Conference at Fermilab last year is to explore alternative technologies. Again, along with e-beam sterilization, alternative gas sterilization technologies are an option. And now we get to the focus of the rest of the webinar. Why is converting from gamma radiation sterilization to e-beam radiation sterilization relatively easy in comparison to other potentially painfully long changes 
and sterilization modality. So we will be diving into the fundamental realities of ionizing radiation. And kind of the tagline here is follow the electrons. This next slide provides um, some resources for background information. Um, Professor Al Sheckley provided a seminar for us over at Abbott and uh, Professor Silverman's paper provides some background. Um, I mentioned a webinar from Amy TR17. We're not talking about material compatibility much in this presentation, but there's a webinar based on the 2008 version. The principles are the same, even though the document's been uh, revised in 2017 to include additional, especially alternative gas sterilization modalities. And then there are uh, Advamed in terms of the actual sterilization validation principles. Um, Advamed has, um, has some webinars that were, were um, developed and uh, those, um, the slide was from a while ago, those may be available at this time. So additional resources on some of the detail. So we're getting in a little bit of the deep waters here in terms of talking about types of ionizing radiation. And the reason being is the goal of this webinar is to give you confidence in going from gamma radiation sterilization to E-beam radiation sterilization. So I'm gonna give you some technical foundations that hopefully when you see this laid out, you will have confidence to realize why this is a potentially much easier path than other conversions. And then we're gonna look at the standards and say, why, does it, why do the standards give the guidance they give? That also support that this can be a relatively easy transition from gamma to e-beam sterilization. So at the very beginning, when we talk about radiation sterilization, it's really ionizing radiation sterilization. And this is the broad scope of ionizing radiation. The reality is for radiation sterilization per the standard, only three of these um, types of ionizing radiation are included, but all three are included, um, E-beam, electrons, gamma, and X-ray. And again, just to stay focused on the science and make sure you have confidence and you're not uh, distracted by the realities of the difference of these types of ionizing radiation, now, gamma and X-ray are photons on the electromagnetic spectrum there, and electrons are very different in that they're particles. So that's just a reality, but as we'll see in the presentation, that is a, um, the reality is they behave in a very similar way, and you'll see why. So this leads to the question, why are gamma, X-ray, and E-beam in the same ISO radiation sterilization standard 11137? And then the second part of this section will be on what guidance is provided in the standard for converting between modalities. So why are gamma and X-ray and E-beam in the same standard? The short answer, they are all ionizing radiation. They all do the same thing to microorganisms and to material, materials, they ionize them. The long answer that we're gonna dive into is that ionization occurs through depositing energy. Fundamentally, radiation is kilogray, kilojoules per kilogram. We're dumping energy, kilojoules, into a given material. Um, so it's depositing energy. And photons from gamma and X-ray sources generate electrons. So that's the mechanism of energy deposition. They generate electrons. And hence, ionized materials in the exact same mechanism as electrons that come from E-beam. So the reality is the, the particle that's doing most of the action is the electron, whether it's generated by a gamma ray or X-ray or whether it's coming from an, directly from an accelerator with E-beam. So let's take a look at this. So again, to give confidence, let's look at what happens inside of a material that is irradiated. So in this case, we're gonna have a, you know, the slide says an aqueous medium that could be a polyethylene or any other medical device material, packaging material. The electron, we're saying an electron's about to bombard in. Let's assume this one comes from an accelerator. 
And the electron that's coming from the primary source we call the primary electron. So it's coming into the material as shown here. What happens? So you end up with this track from the primary electron. And the way the energy is dumped in, again, kilograys, you're dumping in kilojoules of energy into a material, is that a secondary electron is generated, and that secondary electron is generated through ionization. It, the primary electron comes by, has a columbic interaction with the material, and kicks out this secondary electron. It ionizes it. And it has less than 100 electron volts. So we had a 10 million electron volt primary electron from an accelerator, or 5 million electron volt. But whenever those primary electrons go through materials, they generate secondary electrons with very low energy, less than 100 electron volts. And there's a lot of chemistry that happens by that secondary electron. It's called the spur. And that's where all the microbial kill happens, lethality, and that's also where the material degradation or material effects, the positive effects happen from those secondary electrons. So let's do an example of this. You get an electron from a 10 million electron volt E-beam. The primary electron, again, is 10 million electron volts. The energy drops by 100 electron volts with each ionization. So every spur that gets created by an ionization, you drop that energy by 100 electron volts. They generate this spur. So you end up with 100,000 spurs being generated, and it is the secondary electron in each of those spurs where all the chemistry of lethality and material effects happens. Now, if you had a 5 MeV E beam, you would just end up with 50,000 instead of 100,000 spurs. If you had a one MeV beam, you'd end up with 10,000 spurs instead of 100,000. And if you have a half a MeV, a 500,000 um, uh, electron volt one, you'd end up with 5,000 spurs. So this is enormous ratios of, of primary electron to, to spurs. All the actions happening in the spurs. Now, why does this, what does this have to do with gamma, E-beam, and X-ray? Well, the, here's that principle before. That primary electron, in a sense, could be from an E-beam, or it could be the photon that comes out of the gamma uh, process. And I'm not going into it for the sake of time here. There's some backup slides that speak to this. But the photons generate an electron through a process called Compton scattering. That's the mechanism of energy deposition. And the photons go in, the 1.25 on average photons from a cobalt-60 source generate a 0.5 MeV electron, Compton electron it's called, you'll see in the backup slides. 0.5 MeV, that's 5,000 spurs are going to be generated by that electron coming from the gamma and an analogous situation with x-rays but here you start with an e-beam goes into the x-ray converter and you get photon x-rays coming out and those photons go in and generate electrons just like the gamma and then you have the electrons going in and, and creating spurs so in all three cases you have fundamentally, it is electrons going in and creating secondary electrons and spurs and doing all the action. So it is fundamentally equivalent between the three. And now, just for scientific completeness, this is a little more of the picture. It's not always just spurs, you get blobs, and short tracks, and terminating blobs, and secondary electron tracks, et cetera, et cetera. But the same principle is the same. It's electrons coming from E-beams or generated by photons through Compton scattering, or the photons of X-rays, electrons are coming in and doing all the action. That is the fundamental reality of that equivalence and why these modalities are in the same standard. So... What guidance does these standards give in light of that reality to help the industry in terms of transferring dose? When they talk about it in the standard, it's called transferring dose. And so we're getting this question of what guidance is provided for transferring, converting between modalities. And you'll see it's right in the heart of the standard. Sorry for the US-centric version of the ISO standard here. Um, I am based in Southern California. 
and right in the standard. And so you'll see on process definition where you're establishing the max acceptable dose. You know, again, that's the talk talks about product qualification to what dose have you qualified your product? What's your maximum acceptable dose? And establishing the sterilization dose. Right there, it speaks of what's this transference of dose. If you're going to go to a different radiation source, what is that? And there's guidance in the standard. And just a note down there on the bottom, there is an amendment that specifically um, has a change to the guidance on this transference. It has to do a little more with the nuances. If you have um, water in your system, the radiation chemistry is a little different, and there's some nuances in the amendment. For our discussion, the amendment's not particularly relevant. It didn't change the core requirements in the standard. So, again, transference of max acceptable dose. When we talk about product qualification, we're all about that. The verification or sterilization dose has to do with lethality, which is quite simple, as we'll see in case studies. So for the max acceptable dose, what's in the body of the standard is and transferring a max acceptable dose to a radiation source different from that on which the dose was originally established, an assessment shall be made demonstrating that differences in the radiation conditions of the two radiation sources do not affect the validity of the dose. In other words, you've qualified that a max acceptable dose, 42 kilogram, 50 kilogram, 100 kilogram, you get good product performance over time. You want to confirm that at another modality, another source, that you're still getting good performance over time. And this is what's given. This, and now you need to do an assessment and uh, record the outcome. So let's now take the principles we talked about and, and look at what is the standard asking us to look at. There, as we said, they're the exact same mechanism. So what is it in terms of differences of sources that we need to be aware of and manage? So let's do the example of gamma, converting from gamma over to the other modalities. First, going from gamma to gamma. Let's say uh, the gamma irradiator that you're currently using um, gives 25 kilogram in about four hours. So that's approximately two gray per second is the dose rate. And if you do the math, so you get your 25 kilogram dose in four hours. Let's say that you convert to another gamma irradiator and it does it in one hour, or maybe it gives the 25 kilogram in 16 hours. Bottom line is you're within a factor of four there in terms of what your dose rate is when you do that conversion. Now let's look at the e-beam scenario. You get that same 25 kilogram from our beam in Temecula in about four seconds, not four hours, four seconds. So that's a dose rate difference between four hours and four seconds of three to four orders of magnitude, not a factor of four, like with gone from gamma, three to four orders of magnitude. And so that's an enormous difference in dose rate. And in X-ray, you're somewhere in, in the middle. That process is, um, you know, could be, you know, between a minute and, and an hour. And so you're somewhere in, in between the two. So let's think through the implications there. We're, said, we're saying we have to look at the differences in radiation conditions. So what are those differences? What would regulators be expecting you to assess and what would you need to assess to give confidence that the product's gonna perform well? Well, dose rate, that's critical as we just said, three to four orders of magnitude. And why is this important? Because radiation oxygen effects can be different in four hours versus four seconds. In the gamma process, that fundamental chemistry of electrons, uh, ionizing materials and generating spurs, that is ongoing for four hours. Oxygen has a chance to diffuse in and you get some potential for oxidative interactions there. When that all that chemistry happens in four seconds, there's less possibilities of oxygen diffusing in. And so you have the potential, while the overall material effects will be very similar, you have the potential for some oxidative effects in gamma that would not be seen in E-beam. So that's critical. The note here is that you can mitigate that. We used to do that at the University of Maryland where I studied in the lab for radiation polymer 
uh, science, and we'd put samples in a inert environment, seal it in a in a, a pouch that was not permeable to gases. Gases couldn't permeate, and that would um, compensate for this oxygen effect, and you'd get the exact same results in E-beam, even in sensitive materials between E-beam and gamma. So you can mitigate that through inert environments, but that has to be considered and assessed what's going to happen, and then temperature. So gamma, you have an elevated temperature for that entire four, four hours, and E-beam, depending on your materials, you can have a spike in temperature for a few seconds that will dissipate. So that has to be considered, is that clinically relevant for your system? <clears throat> so that is uh, a framework for what are the differences in a radiation condition that um, one needs to consider. After you've considered those, then um, you're in that favorable position, you're in the four second realm when you're using E-beam, so that conversion should go relatively smoothly from the material compatibility effect. So let's put this together on the last slide on this section here. Going from gamma to E-beam, the mechanism energy deposition is identical. Follow the electrons. The higher dose rate of E-beam is favorable. There's less time in the radiation environment. So the standards explicitly speak to you can affect you can expect that there are less effects and so that the material qualification process should be more simple if you're going from a low dose rate to a high dose rate, like E-beam for the reasons we just discussed. Product temperature needs to be managed. And again, you can confirm that, put, put uh, temperature strips inside a product, uh, do IR imaging, whatever, but that temperature needs to be managed and confirmed. You can lower your initial temperature if need be, but that has to be managed as, as part of the expectation. Given those things, that you're, um, you're going from a low to a high dose rate and your temperature, you're not going above any transition temperatures and that spike with E-beam and all that's in good shape, it is reasonable to spec favorable transfer relative to product performance. So um, again, doing a, a relatively minimal testing regime that confirms that would be quite appropriate since all the science is saying you should get good results. And there's nice work being done in the industry to give examples of that like Team Nablo is doing. And then it's also reasonable to spec favorable transfer relative to lethality, especially in dry systems um, that are not in water. There's more nuances in, in systems that have water but um, in terms of controlling dose rate and other things. But for dry medical devices, it's um, very reasonable to expect lethality will be equivalent, and it's very easy to confirm that with a, with a dose audit. And then um, now the heart of the matter, oftentimes now that the science of the product qualification, it seems like a fairly reasonable path, the process efficiency and cost needs to be considered. And most importantly, the DUR, dose uniformity ratio. Can you do the same process um, um, and get a, stay below your maximum acceptable dose um, to be achieved there? And we'll see that in one of our case studies. So that's the summary of um, the content we'll be covering in the seminar and we'll spend the, the rest of our time on case studies. Um, as I take a sip of water here. All right, so the first case study is uh, one that speaks about converting from gamma radiation sterilization to E-beam radiation sterilization in China. And uh, the project driver was improved costs and logistics for high volume commodity product. The product specifications and the current and existing gamma process was a 25 kilogray sterilization dose and a 42 kilogray maximum acceptable dose. So the ratio there, the DUR dose uniformity ratio is 1.68. So project feasibility, the first part um, that we'll look at is the technical assessment of the product and relative to getting lethality in the product. 
uh, again, the expectation there is that there should not be a concern in going from one modality to another in a dry system. This was a dry system here, and that um, was confirmed by doing an e-beam dose audit. So here, using the same uh, dose establishment that was done with gamma and the same verification dose, a dose audit was done with e-beam, and we got the same results confirming that um, with the bobber and under control, you have the same number of organisms, that the resistance of those organisms to e-beam versus gamma was equivalent. That was experimental data to confirm our expectation. And so it's appropriate to transfer that dose from the gamma facility to the e-beam facility. So then we look at max acceptable dose. So can we transfer the max acceptable dose, i.e. is the product um, compatible with e-beam as it was with gamma? Is product performance, especially the clinically relevant ones, uh, the same? And again, following the guidance in the standard, this can be confirmed with basic tests of the most clinically relevant product outputs and cytotoxicity. And um, that work, uh, again, we did a feasibility phase and looked at the basic properties, the, the color of the materials, which was important for the customers and the performance of the materials and the systems and everything looked good at the basic, uh, the basic test when you radiate with E-beam at 42 kilogray or above. And we confirmed in the feasibility phase um, before we start getting into the whole program. Then we looked from the feasibility stage at you know, how are the improved cost and logistics. And the way the product was packaged in the primary package the, and then the corrugate shipping materials that went to the gamma facility, the current packaging drived an e-beam dose uniformity ratio and therefore the max, maximum dose the product will see that is higher than 42 kilogray for a sterilization dose of 25. And so something has to be done. So the options are uh, lower the sterilization dose. So you'll see in the next case study, a product where we used a sterilization dose of 20 kilogray, that corresponds to a bio burden of 45 instead of 1,000 at 25 kilogray. So one question is, is it a product that has a very low and controlled bio burden? And so the sterilization dose could be lowered. The second option, and so just in that example, if we went down to 20 kilogram, let's say it was consistently bio burdens of 10 and 20, no concerns with lowering that specification to 45, and we can uh, qualify with a you know, method BD max 20 or whatever. Um, you then have a DR, DR of over two. So um, um, you have, um, additional room for the e-beam to have a broader DUR, uh, 42 divided by 20 kilogram will not give you a DUR of greater than two. So that, uh, that would help out significantly. The second way there is to repackage. Instead of having a standard package, that may be the easiest one to, to ship and most easily available that gamma can easily penetrate. Maybe you do one that has one dimension that is uh, smaller than the other dimensions so that the e-beam can penetrate through there and keep a DUR of less than 1.68 and keep that maximum acceptable dose at 42 so you don't have to qualify anything, change anything else. And then the third and potentially hardest one is to qualify a higher max acceptable dose then you're pushed into that whole list of testing product performance over the shelf life of the time of the product and maybe you have experience and know-how you know through attempts of to x sterilization that's not as hard uh, as it could be but one of those options need to happen uh, for that and it just so happened in this particular product that um, it was not worth it to the business to do one of those three things we never move forward with that uh, particular example. I didn't say these were great case studies, but these are my reality. Um, and it just goes to that, but, you know, the same thing's true of going from EO to e-beam for those first seven years. We had a lot of situations like this where just the timeline, the cost didn't add up, didn't add up. We kept making progress and getting experience and getting predicate materials and getting regulatory frameworks. And then 
we found a product at year seven that was perfect and it got the momentum going and then a lot of other products followed suit. So this is, <laughs> this is real here that the evaluations are done and then just as just too much of that particular time to make it happen. So let's uh, move on to case study number two. And this is really not a conversion uh, project, but a development uh, project. And it illustrates some of the principles with eBeam that we've been talking about. So I think in terms of um, its applicability here, hopefully you'll agree with me, it, uh, it is helpful. But the project driver here is a novel drug-eluting bioresorbable scaffold. Uh, the prior, this is development project. So again, the sterilization dose and the max acceptable dose have not been defined. What we want is a functional product with an SAL of 10 to the minus six. So that's, that's our goal. As you all are undoubtedly aware, there's new guidance in the industry of how to use alternative SALs. Um, it's always been an ST67. Now there's an ISO guidance document, TS19930, that gives guidance on how to choose alternative SALs if the product is not compatible at 10 to the minus six. So we always start out with that focus on 10 to the minus six. So what happens here on project feasibility, the technical assessment, what's sterilization modalities? We're starting from the very beginning and Amy just published a special edition to, of, um, on sterilization topics and there's a topic about trying to develop with multiple modalities. Um, there's a paper in there. Um, but um, again, we were at the question, which one, you know, was there one that would be compatible? This was very sensitive. It has a drug in it, which is sensitive to sterilization, and then the bioabsorbables are, are fundamentally designed to be sensitive to sterilization. And um, it turned out E-beam was compatible with both the drug and that sensitive bioabsorbable scaffold. Um, gas modalities plasticize the scaffold, as I'll show you in a minute. Um, and then relative to gamma, the E-beam high dose rate was preferred. And since we had E-beam in our network, it uh, was nice to be starting with the highest dose rate uh, radiation sterilization modality that uh, we felt would give us the best opportunity for success. So this, um, I, I'll show you some excerpts from our presentation uh, several years back on this development process. And so, the scaffold is on the right, and you can see on the even a cool ethylene oxide cycle, you can see how with the red dots are where the scaffold was broken. And this is, um, you know, when it's sterilized, it's in the non expanded configuration down, pressed up against that blue inner member. But when, after EO sterilization, it ended up plasticizing some, either the ethylene oxide and or the moisture in the cycle, so that when you expanded the scaffold, you got those breaks in the scaffold. So, and that was true of uh, other issues with alternative gases that we explored. But we, um, as we did E-beam, it was, we were getting a reduction of molecular weight of the, the scaffold there, but we could manage that and we fought and fought and fought for every kilogram we could squeak out of the process. And we ended up with a max dose of 31 kilogram that was compatible with both the drug and the drug loss that came from radiation sterilization was at an acceptable level and the performance of the scaffold was acceptable at 31 kilogram. So as I mentioned, we leveraged an on-site E-beam, which was nice because we had the rapid turnaround time for development and gave us a lot of flexibility to when we were concerned about the temperature spikes, we could cool down product before we processed it. And um, that was very helpful in development. So now on terms of project feasibility and specifically the process definition that we had up on the screen earlier, the establishment of the max acceptable dose, and the, um, the sterilization dose. So as I mentioned, 31 kilogram was the highest dose for drug loss and bioresorbable performance, or DMAX acceptable was defined as 31 kilogram. So now, in order to get a process that would 
um, allow for routine, you know, fairly efficient routine processing, we had to go down to 20 kilogray, which as I mentioned, uh, we need to keep our bio burden below 45 kilogray for this product. Um, and the plans for manufacturing, that was acceptable. We also uh, worked in there um, the ability to augment the dose. So we not only wanted the DUR with the appropriate uncertainty of the dosimetry systems and whatnot factored into that uh, to fit between 20 and 31, we wanted there to be enough space so that if we ever did get a, um, into a situation where we needed to augment the dose, there was enough room in the process to allow that. So the driver there was um, we needed a very efficient configuration. And so we'll talk about that in a minute. And this kind of concretely puts these doses into perspective. So this, for those who are not familiar, is the classic standard distribution of resistances that's in the 11137 standard. And it's uh, the curve that's in table form in the standards. If you draw the curve, it looks like this. For a bio burden of 45, you'll see that that curve goes down and intersects the 10 to, SAL 10 to the minus 6 line at 20 kilogray. So that's that relationship between 20 kilogray and 40, bio burden of 45. This is what the process looks like. To stay under a max acceptable dose of 31 kilogray, and above the sterilization dose of 20 kilogray. Again, this schematic doesn't take into account, doesn't picture the uncertainty and also the fact that we left room to get a uh, dose augmentation of about three kilogray. But in general, that's the picture. Um, just a quick, I gave you one sterility assurance uh, freebie earlier about the guidance on alternative SALs. This is really the second bonus on assurance of sterility. Even in a narrow dose distribution like that, going to 31 kilogray, the reality is you're always less than an SAL 10 to the minus six, down to close to one in a billion, not just one in a million, one in a billion devices with one organism. So again, it just puts into perspective the overkill nature of even radiation sterilization. So that's just um, the perspective on what it means to have a product with a max acceptable dose of 31 and a distribution going down to a, to a sterilization dose of 20 kilogray. And so the key um, last point here in the case studies is that for the performance qualification, the PQ, we needed a special, um, oh my goodness, that's a typo in the slide, a uh, special efficient, <laughs> not inefficient, efficient load configuration developed. And um, well, actually this can go both ways. Um, uh, it had to be efficient in terms of getting low DR. It ended up being relatively inefficient in terms of throughput. Um, it's not like big boxes going through a bulk radiator. But again, with a dedicated E-beam that we had, this was a slower process than others. So there was maybe some inefficiency there. But we had, this was a special load configuration to get this very narrow DUR. And because we had low volume, high value of product, this made this possible. It's not a commodity product. And uh, the fact that we could leverage our on-site E-beam was, was very helpful there. So that's our second case study that I hope was helpful to you. So thank you very much for your attention and slogging through some of the science and the standards to get some of the principles of why converting from gamma uh, radiation sterilization to E-beam is a relatively easy path. And uh, I'll now turn the presentation over to Cody. And at the uh, end of the session, I, hopefully we can uh, field some questions. Cheers. Thank you so much to Byron, wonderful presentation. And we will now be hearing from uh, Cody Wilson, who again is the, um, he is the, um, excuse me, he is the uh, uh, director of um, business development director and product manager at IBA. And he will be delivering the second part of our presentation. Uh, let's welcome Cody. And again, feel free to continue to put your questions and comments into the, uh, the Q&A feature. Welcome, Cody. Hello, everyone. 
My name is Cody Wilson, Program Manager and Business Development Director with IBA. I'd like to thank the audience for making the time to be here today, and I'd like to thank Byron for the excellent introduction to the basics of electron sterilization and material effects. This presentation is going to be an overview of electron sterilization facilities and how they are configured. Let's begin. Electron beam sterilization is a widely used method that is used to treat thousands of products every day. It's an industrialized sterilization modality. There are more than 200 E-beam facilities operating in the world. Over 40 of those use a rototron, the electron accelerator produced by IBA. The technique has been used to sterilize products for over 50 years. Electron beam sterilization is a cost competitive process. Uh, the cost to treat products is similar to ethylene oxide at approximately a dollar per square foot, cubic foot. <laughs> The lead time to produce a center and have it operational is 15 to 18 months. Uh, being widely used, these facilities have an established reliability record. Uh, an operational availability rate greater than 97% has been observed. The power of the electron beam source itself is not typically the limiting factor for throughput. Uh, these are integrated systems and other components are critical to maximizing the rate of sterilization. Optimizing the other components can enable consideration of a higher powered source to increase production. The shape an integrated solution takes is defined by the products and the requirements set by the user. There's no single system configuration to speak of when it comes to electron beam sterilization. As always, start with the products. Next, we look at some questions to ask when considering e-beam sterilization. First, is the product including packaging compatible with radiation treatment? We heard a lot about in Byron's talk about the basic processes at play here and how you can go about answering these questions. If it's determined that the products are compatible with radiation treatment, the next question relates to the size and density of the product. This applies to the packaged or unpackaged form of the products. Is it boxes of consolidated products, pallets, individual products? Calculations and simulations can be performed to answer this question. If the products are considered high by the thickness and density metric, gamma or x-ray sterilization is appropriate. If the answer is low, e-beam sterilization is a good candidate. If there's a mix of high and low products, systems capable of sterilizing with both e-beam and x-ray are available. If e-beam has been identified as an appropriate modality, further considerations will determine the configuration of the facility. A few of the basic questions that need to be addressed are, is two-sided irradiation required? Uh, this depends on more precise evaluation of the thickness and density. If the required dose uniformity ratio is not achievable by a single side of radi irradiation, treatment of a second side will be required. What variety of products are intended for treatment? Will they vary significantly in size? Will some require totes for transportation while others do not? Uh, this ver variability definition will have impacts on the system configuration as well. Um, what's the desired system throughput? Uh, when all the other considerations about the products have been answered, the required treatment volume will affect the final form the integrated system takes. This is a high level summary of e-beam selection for sterilization. With that introduction, we proceed to an overview of the e-beam sterilization process. As I emphasized in the introduction, uh, these facilities are integrated systems. They're made up of various components that need to work in harmony to execute the sterilization process. At the center of these components is the process control system, or PCS. This is a customized software platform that synchronizes the operation of each component. The PCS serves as the brain of the system. External to the E-beam facility, the PCS interfaces with the enterprise resource planning system that manages overall facility operations. It's also connected to the dosimetry system set up in the facility and its design use for verifying product treatment. Uh, the PCS is a customized to optimize the treatment process and maintain regulatory compliance by recording all the system parameters during treatment. Here we see a schematic representation of the PCS functionality. Information about the products to be treated is selected during preparation and a treatment recipe is generated and input to the system. The PCS takes over and the production process is executed automatically. Throughout the process, all system parameters are recorded. At completion of treatment, a report is generated identifying validated or rejected products. That's the PCS. 
In this video, you see a representation of boxes being loaded onto the system and product labels and dosimeters being applied. Obviously, the products need to be loaded into the system. However, there are a number of options available to meet facility requirements to accomplish this. Some of the things to consider in designing the loading system, the number of conveyor lanes the system requires, uh, is a connection with the production system necessary or are the products arriving on pallets, is a manual loading process required, or is, there a, or is an automated system needed, perhaps consisting of an automatic depalletizer or a product handling system interfacing with the production line? The next part of the process we look at is the product treatment. Uh, this video shows boxes being transported to the electron beam. Space between the products is minimized in order to make maximum use of the electron beam. And the electron beam is then scanned across the product as it's transported through. Configuration of this portion of the process requires a number of components to be considered. Uh, one important configuration selection is the electron beam source itself. The photos at the right here show two widely used options, a Rotatron and a Linac. In addition to the accelerator, the electron source consists of a beam scan, scanning system and a scattering plate. Source selection requires determining a number of important properties, including the electron energy itself. Uh, this energy can range from hundreds of kilo electron volts to 10 mega electron volts. Uh, energy selection is guided by product properties and the required dose uniformity ratio. The scan width is another source property to determine. Uh, this is informed by the size of the products to be treated and the number of products allowed in the beam at one time. Another important design decision is whether top-down or lateral irradiation is optimal. This will again largely depend on the nature of the products. One more thing is the precision that the speed of the products passing through the beam can be controlled with. Uh, this will have an impact on the electron source configuration as well. The next part of the process we consider is the conveyor. Uh, the video shows boxes being transported along a conveyor with a tornado for flipping the boxes to control the side of the product presented to the electron beam. There are many options for the conveyor design that will as always be determined by the product requirements. A, cube, a few key points for conveyor design. Uh, is two-sided treatment required? Um, if so, there are multiple options for accomplishing this. The tornado here is one of them. Are multiple passes needed to achieve the minimum dose level required to all parts of the product? Uh, there are also many product handling and control features available for the conveyor design choice. The final part of the process we look at in this overview is unloading the product from the sterilization system. Prior to unloading, the treatment process must be validated. The video here shows dosimeters being removed and tested for validation. The PCS is also capable of providing automated treatment validation. There are a number of configuration options available to meet facility requirements for removing products from the e-beam system. Some things to consider. Uh, how many conveyor lanes are there? What is the connection between the system and the storage facility? Is an automatic palletizer required? Are dedicated lanes needed for rejected products or those directed for dosimetry measurement? That completes our overview of the basics of the electron beam sterilization process. Now, if you're interested in exploring this as a sterilization method for your products, you might ask, where do I start? In this section, we introduce the process. As stated, at nearly every step, the configuration process starts with properties of the product to be treated. A user's business case also informs the configuration decisions. The first step in the design process is generating a user requirement specification. Input from a customer can vary in level of detail. Uh, a complete set of specifications can be provided and sometimes is. For customers not prepared to provide that level of detail, a minimum amount of information is required and there's a system in place to complete the full specification. After the URS is in place, Monte Carlo simulations are performed to determine a number of configuration requirements like beam energy and a decision on the necessity of two-sided treatment. Next, the rest of the design is optimized for product dose requirements and production volume. The configuration design begins with conveyor selection. With that in place, other options can be selected for the integrated solution to meet the user requirements. 
Finally, a plan is regenerated for installation, operation, and product qualification, IQ, OQ, and PQ. With some of the configuration options controlled, the PCS can simulate production schedules for, a diff for different scenarios and offer insight into the impact of various design decisions. This graph shows the simulated production for various configurations. All of these runs use a 10 MeV beam. Uh, the x-axis here is beam power and the y-axis is production in cubic meters. You see three lines here corresponding to different loading scenarios. Uh, the blue line is products in trays. The orange line is products with only one box allowed under the beam. And the red points are for multiple boxes under the beam. I'll highlight a couple of trends from this output that relate to configuration decisions. First, there's this regime where the product production results are increased linearly with beam power. Uh, this is dominated by the ability to increase the conveyor speed with higher powered electron beams. However, this has diminishing returns as the conveyor bottlenecks begin to become the limiting factor in throughput. Further increases in throughput are accessible through product handling options described earlier. Enabling multiple boxes to be in the beam at one time is an example. You might notice that even with the simulated product handling options in place, there's a point where the production volume flattens. This represents the limitation of the product handling options put into these calculations. Uh, further improvements would be necessary to yield higher, higher production rates at those beam power levels. So this summarizes the configuration process. Um, I would like to emphasize that this is a collaborative process and the decision is optimized to meet the product and business case needs by working together between all parties. With the basics of how to begin the configuration selection in place, we'll look at a brief overview of some standard configurations available from IBA. Uh, these configurations have been arrived at by executing this process for different customers. This is by no means an exhaustive list of configurations available from IBA and other manufacturers have additional configurations as well. This slide shows a configuration where a lateral beam delivery system was selected. When a configuration is determined, a data sheet detailing the, all the relevant parameters of the configuration is generated. Uh, the table on the right shows a subset of those parameters. This configuration is designed for a product mix determined to be of a medium variation level, and it's capable of a production level of up to 140,000 cubic meters per year. Another key parameter customers would be interested in is the footprint of the system, which is shown in this data table as well. Uh, the, in the picture in the center here on the left side, you see the lateral scan horn in place. And then on the right side of that picture is the beam stop. Um, down in the bottom left corner, there is a picture of the conveyor. This is a dual level conveyor, and that design choice was made to minimize through the footprint of the facility. And back in the picture on the right, in the center there, the conveyor switches over to a chain transport system in front of the beam for precise position control and uh, dose verification control. Okay. On this slide, we will go through six photographs from other configurations. Uh, presenting the details of each configuration wouldn't be feasible in the amount of time we have today, but these systems have been produced, updated, and improved. Data is available for each of the configurations we show here to help inform a customer's design decision. The first configuration we look at here is a system that accepts both boxes and totes. A single box top-down system with flipping is shown here. And this one is a top-down configuration that allows multiple boxes in the beam at one time. And finally, a duo system that's capable of performing both E-beam and X-ray sterilization. Next, we look at an, another important part of the configuration process, uh, the factory acceptance tests or FATs. Uh, components are assembled at the factory and an agreed upon set of tests are performed before a component is accepted. Uh, the video here shows a conveyor system undergoing FAT. Um, and below the images you see, are for another FAT for a tray-based conveyor system. 
that completes the overview of the standard configurations available. Um, consider these a starting point uh, where they don't match product need, customizations will be put in place by working together. So what if a customer doesn't have a product with enough information to apply the configuration process that we've been talking about? There are centers available for performing tests on your products to inform the configuration. All service providers of e-beam or x-ray sterilization facilities offer support for these dose mapping and product qualification. On this slide, we show one option available for product and process testing. IREL operates the Ferex facility in Strasbourg, France. Uh, this facility has a wide variety of capabilities, including a radiation test with different beam types, dose mapping services, material tests and process optimization, optimization tools, and much more. Uh, if you're interested in more information, we are happy to connect you to IRL. Now we come to the conclusion of our presentation. In summary, uh, while e-beam sterilization is a reliable industrial sterilization process in wide use, there's no one size all fits config configuration. Uh, successful implementation requires close collaboration between facility providers and customers to optimize configuration for the products to be treated and the business case behind the effort. Once configured, the process control system will automatically control treatment so that sterilization can be reliably performed and evidence of regulation compliance can be readily produced. This presentation is an invitation to engage. Uh, we're here to discuss your business needs, share our experience with the large install base of sterilization facilities, and connect you to treatment validation centers if your products require further study. Finally, I'd like to remind everyone that this is the first in a series of webinars. Today, we've covered the basics of electron beam irradiation, and we invite you to return for four new chapters that will be coming soon. Uh, the next session will cover our product validation in x-ray and electron beams. After that, we'll focus on project experience with electron beam facilities and look at a case study that goes into further detail than we did today. The next session highlights the differences between x-ray sterilization and other modalities. And finally, we'll have a session on product, project experience with x-ray and present a case study. I want to thank you all again for your attendance and thank you again to Byron. From there, we will proceed to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Cody. Uh, yes, everyone, we do still have time for Q&A. We've dedicated about um, 20 minutes that we have here. I want to invite our uh, wonderful speakers and panelists to turn on their cameras at this time. Again, Byron Lambert of Abbott. We have Cody Wilson of IBA Industrial, and they're going to be joined by their colleague, uh, Jeremy Brisson, who's again R&D Program uh, and Rototron Product Director at IBA Industrial. Uh, welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you again to all of our attendees for submitting your questions. We'll be getting to them in just a moment. Again, please send them through via the Q&A feature in the toolbar. We will be dedicating time right now to be addressing uh, questions specific to the medical device industry, but of course know that we have a variety of attendees on the line today. Um, if you have a question outside of the, the device industry, please feel free to submit it and someone from IBA will be following up at a later date. Uh, but thank you again to all of our panelists for joining us. Uh, let's jump right into our first question, uh, which I believe Byron's going to answer. This question came through and says, does going from air to an inert atmosphere, N2, also affect lethality? Have there been any studies done to show equivalent lethality for irradiation in air or inert atmosphere, everything else uh, remaining the same? Uh, so again, Byron, this question is looking at going from air to an inert atmosphere, and how does it affect lethality? Thanks, Brooke. Yeah, great question. Um, there has been indeed, and if you look at the... Uh, informational annex and the standards, some of that uh, work is described, especially as I mentioned before, in cases where there's water, there's differences. But the nice thing about transferring dose as it relates to lethality is that the evidence, the experimental evidence that you need really comes through doing the uh, a dose audit experiment. 
that's where you're challenging the number and the resistance of your organisms. So if that environment changes, if you're radiating in, a, in one environment and you're moving to another one, or if you're just getting started, by doing the dose establishment or a dose audit experiment, you're literally getting the data to show that those organisms have equivalent resistance. Lovely. Thank you so much for that perspective. Again, we have set this up so the attendees can submit questions through the Q&A feature. Please do send them through there. Uh, moving right along, I believe the next question is for Cody. Uh, Cody, what is the acceptable DUR for medical devices in electron beam? Yeah, I can take this question, but, but perhaps Byron can jump in as well. I mean, he covered a lot about this in his presentation. You know, the, the place to start is determining both the minimum acceptable dose that you're targeting and the maximum acceptable dose that you're targeting that you can accept on a product. So it's a product qualification process. And then from there you, you know, you, you have to establish safety factors to make sure that you can reach that minimum level reliably and not exceed the maximum level reliably. So you, you'll, you'll optimize your DUR to fit, fit on a product by product case. There's, there's no single answer there. Byron, I don't know if you want to add any color to that. Yeah, you bet, Cody. Um, and there was another question related to this that I saw coming in that talked about the realities that I've done a process that has a certain range, a sterilization dose up to a given dose, 42 kilograms was in my example, but it could be another dose. And what's the difference between that maximum dose that a product sees and what the standard refers to as the maximum acceptable dose? And let me tell you about the theoretical best case and then reality. So, as you're, if you go to Ariel or other, you know, one of the vendors and want to qualify your product or work that through, the optimum situation is you actually rigorously figure out what is the highest dose that your product can perform reliability over reliably over its shelf life. So I refer to that as dose ranging studies. Maybe you do, you radiate to 25, 50, and 100 kilogray, and you see how that performance looks um, as a function of dose, and then you figure out where your product specification is and define what's your maximum acceptable dose the product performs well to. That's the proactive way to figure out the real answer to max acceptable dose. In practice, oftentimes people do what was suggested in the other question and have a process and have run it at the top end of that process and product performs well. So that is by default, the max acceptable dose, as well as the maximum dose that the product has gotten in a process. So um, that just that just kind of gives a feel for the spectrum of how you define that in best case versus in, in practice. Thank you so much. Great insight. Uh, another quick note, uh, IBA and uh, Byron were kind enough to provide us with a copy of the recording, which will be available for download on the IBA Industrial YouTube channel, and we will also be sending it out. Uh, but continuing right along with questions, again, for any of our, our wonderful global panelists here, uh, can anyone talk a little bit more about good, a uh, quote unquote good DUR? Another great question. I think Cody hit on it in his presentation continually. It's all about the product, which ultimately is the, all about the patient and what, you know, how's your performance? What's clinically relevant to the performance of your product? And what is that dose, that, that max acceptable dose your product will perform well to? And then, um, you know, you need to understand that because you have to keep the patient safe. And then it's a matter of defining a process underneath that. And the more rigorously you do it, the higher you get that max acceptable dose, the more range you have to have an efficient, cost-effective solution that has many options. Um, so I don't think there's a real answer to that. Again, I shared an example of a very sensitive product that needed a narrow distribution and low doses. Um, that, that makes, you know, the overall process less efficient, the broader you can make that DUR, the easier your business case and the more efficiently you can process probably at lower costs, so. 
Lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, Cody, this one's for you, but again, to our panelists, feel free to contribute. Uh, this question was saying, Cody, I noted on your example chart, uh, again, during the IBA presentation, that uh, 100 kW, there was a leveling off of throughput. Is this because the conveyor handler couldn't handle a start-stop test at faster speeds or some other uh, more important reason? So again, this was in a chart that Cody was uh, referring to in his presentation, uh, 100 kW, there was a level of, uh, I'm sorry, leveling off of throughput. Is this because the conveyor handler couldn't handle a start-stop test at faster speeds or was there uh, other more important reasons? Yeah, Jeremy can feel free to jump in here too, but I tried, to, we were moving a little quickly, but I tried to emphasize that that, that computation of throughput there relies on a set of assumptions and, you know, a certain number when it, for each case, a certain you know, set of product handling and conveyor inputs were, were put in there. And I tried to indicate that, yes, um, you know, eventually you, you run into limitations given your product handling assumptions. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the process that I try to describe as we go that it's, it really is about, making each one of those configuration decisions at each point to to try to realize your throughput based on the products and, and your business case. So, so yeah, so we you so can keep just, going just through a bunch complete, of different uh, other combinations. To complete on that, no, it's not it's not a question of start and stop. It's really a question of managing the volume and uh, moving the product that fast. You know, uh, what you can do if you want to go about above that, you can do a, a wider scan arm, for example. But that means that you, you have to bring multiple boxes in front of the beam and you have to manage that with uh, more and more complex conveyors. And so we see that at some point, uh, maybe X-ray is a better option to keep it on the pallet and to move bigger products. So we see that with the beam, uh, with 100 kilowatts, we, we some kind we somehow reach uh, the limit of the of the of the, of the process on, on that side. I mean, moving the product, depalletizing, putting the, the boxes on the conveyor, and moving very fast at very high speed. Uh, we have accelerator, as you know, going to hundreds of kilowatts, uh, but this is really a physical limit for eBeam to move the product. So it's not a start and start stop uh, issue because that we can control uh, accurately uh, with the with the Rodotron uh, especially, uh, but uh, it's another another question here. Mm. Appreciate the clarification and the insight on that. Um, moving right along, uh, gamma irradiation, irradiation is known to initiate uh, degradation in some products with this degradation progression over time after the irradiation has been completed. Does this happen to the same degree when irradiation is by E-beam or X-ray? Um, and any to the panelists, uh, but Byron, um, again, does, the, does this happen um, to the same degree when irradiation is by E-beam or X-ray? Yeah, another great question there, Brooke. Um, and I think in general, the answer is yes. So one of the reasons explicitly in the 1137 standard calls out to confirm product performance over the shelf life of your product is because radiation does have the potential all modalities of ionizing radiation have the potential to generate long-lived radical species, especially in um, materials that are glassy, that, are, that can trap um, radicals. You can generate the radicals and they can, can persist for long periods of time and potentially affect product performance. It's just a reality of of uh, radiation sterilization that you need to prove out of your shelf life studies or are not germane to your products. Are they those effects different in gamma versus E-beam versus X-ray? Um, you know, again, you have the kind of materials that will trap um, those long of radicals. That doesn't change. Is the rate at which those are generated in four seconds versus four hours, will that affect Again, my, my basic proposition here is these are all ionizing radiation. In general, they have the same macro performance, effect on performance of products. Could there be small nuances? Maybe, um, you know, I wouldn't expect it, you know, to be significantly different. Um, so no, I wouldn't expect them to be significantly different between between the three modalities, what the shelf life uh, properties would be. 
Thank you so much to everyone. These are fantastic questions. We've got about five to six minutes left, so I'm just going to continue. Another great question that came through, what is the future of eBeam when today we see it takes only 10% market shares uh, versus 80% of cobalt ones? Uh, Byron or to any of the panelists, what um, in your opinions are the future of eBeam when today it sees only 10% of market shares versus 80% of cobalt? Yeah, I'll certainly hand off to my IBA colleagues here. Um, you know, the perspective at that Fermilab conference that um, IBA and Mevex presented is their ability to, to grow, to meet additional de demand is, is exciting to the industry as there's pressure both in the EO world and in the gamma world. And, you know, both those industries are working to be responsible and they're both workhorse technologies that medical device manufacturers need. Um, but that ability to grow and meet that uh, demand as there are pressures and issues is encouraging from the medical device manufacturer's perspective. Yeah, I think, you know, I Everyone would acknowledge that eBeam is growing and it will take, you know, a, a larger portion of the pie, but um, ETO and Gamma are not going away. You know, they're, that's, that's, they're here. They, there's a lot of satisfied customers with using them, but as Byron talked about, there are pressures on those modalities via environmental security, availability, um, and the whole market's growing. So, you know, the E-beam and, and X-ray and will continue to grow. Um, but it's, you know, there's, it's, a, it's a market analysis to try to determine what the, the portion of the pie they'll take over the coming, coming period. Jeremy, anything to add here? No, I think uh, I totally agree with that. And I think we'll see something more balanced. We'll see uh, e being coming as a, as a nice complement to, uh, to, to Gamma and EO. And uh, uh, we'll see more and more uh, product being tested, validated, new products uh, going maybe directly to, to eBeam. We also see new, new tools, which are very important, uh, both uh, in the US and in Europe and, and, and soon in Asia to, to validate this product on real systems with experts. And so we, we, we strongly believe that this will bring uh, a more balanced um, uh, offer uh, to the to to the to the, the, the community, and uh, it's difficult to predict the exact numbers, but we we see something uh, more balanced in the very soon. Lovely, lovely. Um, and I believe we've got time for one last question here. Um, and Byron, I believe this is for you. But again, panel, feel free to contribute. Uh, during the PQ, do you also perform any microbiology challenge tests? Or is it solely based on the dosimetry uh, measurements? If so, what organism do you typically work with? Um, Great to get that clarified. No, the radiation sterilization standards explicitly um, recommend not uh, using challenge devices, the industry does. Um, the model there, the radiation sterilization validation model is actually a bio burden based model. So we're actually challenging the natural bio burden on the products, so the whole dose establishment process and the subsequent dose auditing. We're actually challenging the bio on the product that um, is being manufactured and then you group products into that family and show equivalence of that and that they all have the same in the same category of how many bugs and what's the resistance of the microorganisms. So no, absolutely not having a, a challenge device in radiation sterilization. Um, the whole model is based on challenging our, the actual organisms on the product. Really great questions. We're just about at time. So any further questions or comments or uh, thoughts from our panelists before I wrap up? No, I'm, I'm delighted to be part of the webinar. Thanks for inviting me. Delighted to be helping out the industry here um, per the Fermilab presentation. Uh, the gamma to E-beam is a unique scenario. Same modalities of ionizing radiation in the right trajectory of going from a low dose rate to high dose rate. So um, for the industry to have competence when needed to go there is, is important to help with the overall supply chain for the industry. So again, thanks for letting me be a part of this. 
I would like to personally thank Byron and Cody for the, the great talks. And uh, I think uh, despite the, the COVID, uh, we've seen some very nice uh, enthusiasm and around the, the, the talks and the seminar, the webinars that we've seen the last few weeks at Fermi, at Steris, at different uh, different uh, groups. And uh, I think uh, this one was a, a nice complement to that with the, the, the concrete cases of Byron and the, the concrete approach, Cody, uh, to show how we, we can help you to set, set up the real projects. And uh, so uh, thank you very much both for preparing these and, uh, and I look forward to, to further discuss this subject in the, in the coming sem webinars. Yeah, thank you again for everybody for being here. And as you said, this is the beginning to a conversation and we're here, you see our emails on that uh, slide that we're looking at and we're, you know, we're, we're open for conversations and we wanna, we wanna work with you and help you find a successful solution for your products. Lovely. Thank you so much again to our panelists. Again, Byron Lambert, who's a senior associate research fellow in sterilization science and founder of Abbott's Assurance of Sterility Task Force. Uh, Cody Wilson, product manager, business development director at IBA Industrial, as well as their colleague, uh, Jeremy Brisson, who is the R&D program and Rototron product director at IBA Industrial. Very excited and looking forward to what's coming up in the series of webinars that will be coming from IBA. So thank you so much to our panelists um, and a truly big big thank you to all of our attendees today for investing your time with us we certainly hope that you found this webinar informative and hope that you can join us for the other series um, that uh, IBA will be presenting on the webinar again once we get off the line we will be in touch with a copy of the presentation uh, recording which will be on the IA IBA um, YouTube channel um, and also continue to feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A feature here. Uh, if we didn't get to one that was medically device focused, uh, IBA will be following up with you uh, post webinar. Um, I know we had some people dialed in through the phone. Please feel free to submit any further questions or comments to IBA via email to me to webinars at q1productions.com. But thank you again to all of our attendees for investing your time. Uh, big, big thank you to again our global panel. Uh, uh, Byron, I know it's quite early for you, Jeremy, later in the afternoon, Cody and I uh, first thing in the morning here as well. So thank you again to all of our panelists, all of our attendees, and a special thank you to IBA Industrial for sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, thank you again, everyone. Be safe and be well. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone.